So last week we had Pastor Glenn Barnes. He was here from First Baptist of Loda, and he talked to us about marriage and, and what that, and that was a beautiful, just a beautiful word of from the scripture, this is what biblical marriage looks like. It's such a good reminder. And then the week before that, Pastor Elliot uh, brought the word and he was talking about marriage, but he primarily talked about it from the husband's point of view or the man's point of view. Um, and just, he was really speaking to husbands and speaking to men. And so I, it's going to be both. And there's enough content for all of us here today. It doesn't matter who we are, uh, but I am going to be speaking from, from that wifely uh, point of view. And I just wanted to go back because this is so my, the title of my message is the marriage challenge part two, because Pastor Elliot brought the marriage challenge part one a couple weeks ago, and it was great content. And then how many of you guys ever remember what was spoken the week before? Probably nobody. I don't. Uh, even when I speak it, there's like maybe one thing I remember that I said, you know, so no, there's no judgment there. Uh, but so I'm going to remind you of what happened at the very end of his message. He gave the marriage challenge and the marriage challenge was. Ask your spouse, if you're married, how am I doing? That was the challenge. Ask your spouse, how am I doing? And I don't know about you, but, okay, no, no, no. I'll tell you, I'll tell you things. Okay, so um, for some of us, there may have been like inside your soul going like, no, <laughs> there's no way I'm going to turn around and ask my spouse that question. And, and here's, here's why I want to talk about two ditches that we can fall into. There's the ditches of blind pride. Blind pride would say, I don't need to ask my spouse how I'm doing because I'm doing great. You know, like I know I'm doing great. I'm so good for you. I do good things for you all the time. You know, blind pride would, would keep us from asking like, you know, arrogance would keep us from asking those things or insecure resistance. Insecure resistance is I am already so critical of myself and I already know all the places where I'm not doing well, I'm not serving well. And so I, because I'm afraid you're only going to tell me more of what I'm doing wrong, I can't even engage in that question. So those are two ditches on either side, that, that blind pride or that insecure resistance that would keep us from engaging in real conversation with the people closest to us saying, how am I doing? But we don't want to ignore the invitation because that's an invitation for growth, to have the courage. <laughs> That's a courageous question to ask, how am I doing? And then be able to stand and receive. And it should be both celebratory. You're doing like, I love that you do this and you're so great. You honor me in this. You respect me in this. You love me so well when you do this. And I love that. So on either side of that question, there should be, we should be expecting celebration, but we should also be expecting, like, I know there's places for improvement, but would you just be kind with me <laughs> when, when you, when you, when you lead me to those places? places. Uh, so we don't want to ignore the invitation for growth. Um, so I want to ask us how we integrate that. So marriage challenge part two is how do we integrate that? Uh, some of you may have, I talked to a few of you guys within the last couple weeks. And so I know a few of you took the marriage challenge and you asked each other that question and it was good. Like you guys have, you're in a place of health. You've learned how to have good conversation. And so it was okay for you to ask that question and receive. Uh, and it, it was good. There was both, and there was celebration and there was like, uh, but you know, maybe we could get better at this. And it was a conversation together. You were going places. And I love that. I love to see healthy marriage marriages where we've got great communication skills. Some of you may have taken the challenge and things might have gotten more intense than they've ever been before in your life. <laughs> if you took it. And, and here's why. Because if you've never done it before and you're asking each other, how am I doing? And you're getting real live feedback then you got to integrate it, you know? And so that can become intense where we're, uh, where we're recognizing some of our flaws, some of our weaknesses, some of the places where we can grow. And that's a sensitive place to be. And so it feels like the heat gets turned up or the intensity gets turned up as we engage in that because it's growth, it's purifying, uh, but that doesn't remove the intensity. And then some of you may just be wrestling with the fact that I don't want to ask the question. <laughs> you know, you're, you're like, this is great, but you're not going to take the marriage challenge. You just may not be ready to take the plunge. And so what I want to do is I want to help us. I want to help us today because marriage and relationships are hard, but they're even harder when you feel like you're all alone or you're like, you're the only people who are going through or dealing with whatever it is that you're dealing with. Because when marriage, marriage is between two people, it's the husband and the wife. And so this is real life. Maybe the wife is going through something and she wants to talk to somebody 
but she also doesn't want to air her dirty laundry um, or, or like dishonor her husband. And so for, oh, and same thing with husbands. Husbands may be going through something, but generally men don't tend to be as relational. And so they carry burdens, they carry failure, they carry the places where I, I know I'm not winning in this area, but I don't know who to talk to about it. And so instead of coming together, we grow farther apart because we don't know who to talk to and we don't know how to engage the conversation because there's already a point of, of weakness or there's already a point of insecurity. And these are real things. And so I I want to encourage us today, number one, you're not alone. (laughs) If you've ever felt like that, that's a real thing. And we've got, we've got to know it, but we've also got to know that there's tools for growth. So we don't stay in those places of isolation and loneliness and growing apart. And I want to encourage you because if you've had those roller coaster emotions where first you're, you're really, really, really angry. And then all of a sudden you're really, really, really happy. You know, like it's angry, happy, or you're satisfied and then you're dissatisfied or you know exactly what you want in life and out of your marriage. And then all of a sudden you have no idea what you want out of life and what you want out of your marriage. Um, can, can I tell you that it's all happened to both Elliot and myself? in the last month. Every single one of these has happened to me personally and us together. I have no doubt in my mind that part of that was the enemy going, if you're going to talk about marriage and you're going to bring health and wholeness, I'm going to try and attack it. And so there's, there was a real thing where Elliot and I had to do come together and stand firm in that. But these are things, and I'm bringing you things, we've walked through these things and we've done these things. And so I bring them as an encouragement and as a challenge and as an admonition, as the people of God, there is growth for us. And, and, it's, and it's in our families. So, you know, as Christians, we want Christ-centered lives. We want Christ-centered marriages. We want Christ-centered families, but they're not stress-free. Even when Christ is in the middle, they're not absent of problems. Our, our, our families are not absent of stress. They're not absent of frustration. And why is that? Because we're there. <laughs> it's because we're in the middle of our relationships. And so his, Jesus says, he declares it himself, and I believe it, his yoke is easy and his burden is light. He is perfect peace and he is perfect love. He gives us rest for our souls. He has overcome the world and he gives us his strength and he gives us his wisdom to overcome trials and problems. And for every temptation, Jesus has made a way out. And I believe that, but those burdens and those trials and those temptations have not been removed from our lives. A way has been made, absolutely, but here's what it is. We have to learn to walk in it. We've got to walk it out. we got to see it, believe it, and then walk into it, and that's our position. Our position is to walk into those things, so there's action on our part, and so that's a lot of today is action. I'm giving you action to live in that place of faith, to live in that place of blessing, to live in that place of rest. So there's hope, there's peace, there's rest, let's learn how to walk in it today. So my big kind of subtitle as we move through this is just walking with Jesus. I want to walk with Jesus in my marriage, in my relationships, in my life. And I'm going to live in Matthew uh, chapter 7 for the most part. It'll be Matthew chapter 7 on the front end, and I'm going to close in the book of 1 Peter. But Matthew chapter 7, And as I was getting, like, I knew this series was coming. I'm thinking about marriage. Okay, there's so many things we could say about relationships and spouses and marriages. But I wanted, it was like the nitty gritty. Like, we need to get into the nitty gritty of some stuff. And so I was having a conversation with someone, and it was the real life issues. And so that's what I want to talk about. I want to address our real life issues and the things that we say and teach us how to do them biblically. (laughs) Like, I want to give us practical biblical ways to address the real things that happen in our lives and in our hearts. So, and the perfect the scripture, the, the, the very one thing that I wanted to talk about was when Jesus, he talks to the people that are listening to him, and he says, why do you worry about the speck in your friend's eye when you've got a log in your own eye? I was like, okay, that's the one. That's the one. So I went and I looked up, and I wanted to use that whole passage of scripture because it's so good. So Matthew 7, verse 1 through 5, I'm going to open there. Jesus is talking to a crowd of people. He's on a mountain. And he says, and I love his heart because it comes out as harsh. But can I tell you the heart of Jesus is he's looking over. He's surveying the crowd of people who are listening to him. And he's, he loves them with an everlasting, eternal love. And so he says some difficult things, but then he brings it back with his heart. And so I want to walk us through that. But he says, do not judge others and you will not be judged for you will be treated as you treat others. 
The standard you use in judging is the standard by which you will be judged. And I love that because first and foremost, he's talking to the insecurity of people. He says, you fear judgment. You fear condemnation. You're insecure in your relationships. And can I tell you why? It's because you, you pass judgment. And so now you're afraid of being judged in return. There's a tenderness in that scripture, and we may have not seen it before. And so to make this kind of funny, you don't have to raise your hand, please. But have you ever said, I put in this, have you ever said of your husband, but it could be of your spouse. Have you ever said of your spouse, I told you we're getting nitty gritty, my husband or my spouse, and you say it angrily on the inside, it's so selfish. <laughs> my spouse is so lazy, you know, like you're angry on the inside. Uh, my husband or my spouse doesn't care about anybody. He only ever thinks about himself. You ever been so, you don't have to say it, so frustrated. Or it's always his way or the highway. You know, like it's got to be that way or no way at all. If you're not married, this is still applicable in, in some kind of relationship in your life. You could have said it about a parent. You could have said it about a sibling. You could have said it about a friend. You could have said it about a boss. You could have said it about a coworker. They're so selfish. They don't even know what they're doing. Like, do they realize how much I do for them? And I don't get anything in return. They don't even see it. This is the stuff. You know what I mean? Like, I know it exists in all of us. I'm not, I'm going to let that linger there for just a minute. I'm going to let it linger. He says in verse three, Jesus says, why worry about a speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own? How can you think of saying to your friend, let me help you get rid of that speck in your eye when you can't see past the log in your own eye? And he calls us all hypocrites. And he says, first get rid of the log in your own eye, then you will see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. And a hypocrite, it really just means imposter or pretender. You're pretending everything's okay with you and right with you. You're so righteous that you can go around and help other people. But the truth is not one of us is righteous. Not one. We all need salvation. We all need the glory of God to come upon our lives. And so he invites us into that. You don't have to have it all together. You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to be the one to solve all the problems. Let me love you. Let me wash things over you. And so when I'm thinking about this, because this is, this is the real stuff, and this is the stuff that causes tension. You know, like we have our opinions. What that is when we say they're so selfish, uh, they don't get it, they don't understand, they don't see all the things that, like I do all of this and I don't get anything in return. We've, we've had moments like that. All that is, is us making an agreement with the enemy of their soul. And now we're passing judgment that's a lie this is, this is a lie. We're putting a lie on them and saying that's who they are when in reality, that's not who they are at all. There's an enemy of your soul and an enemy of their soul. And when we see that and we say it, I have now agreed with the enemy and I have brought death over that. I have brought death over my relationship. I have brought death over my ability to communicate because I have agreed with a liar. <laughs> and so I want to, I want to help us not do that. So before we go all ballistic, cause that's what our tendency is. I get frustrated. You know, we get frustrated about things and we don't know how to talk about them. And so we, 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 we say things, we say hurtful words. We engage in angry heat. We call them heated, passionate discussions, <laughs> but the, you know, the stuff of life is that's not what it feels feels like, you know, you walk away going, Ugh. okay, so before you go all ballistic, this is what we do. Talk with Jesus first. Talk with Jesus first. And this is what I mean, because I, if we're people who were being a lifeline and we're leading people to become lifelong followers of Jesus, I got to know how to walk with Jesus in my marriage. I got to know how to walk with Jesus in my life. I have to know how to talk with Jesus. And see, so if you don't know how to do that, I'm encouraging you to wrestle with the practice. And that may be, I, I don't know what to do. I'm going to, I'm going to lead us through it, but it's as simple as Sometimes for me, it's the bathroom guys. Okay. When I'm like, like I'll go in the bathroom. First of all, most of the time, if I'm frustrated, I cry. <laughs> okay. So I have to go in the bathroom because that's where the toilet paper is. We don't buy tissue. I use toilet paper, you know, so my nose is raw. This is real stuff. This is the stuff of life people. And if you think we've never, Ellie and I have a great marriage. I love us so much, but we're real people. And can I tell you that we work together? So if you've ever been frustrated at work, you can go home. We sleep together. 
Okay, so we're frustrated at work, and then we go home. This is real stuff. We've had, so we, when I'm bringing this stuff, we've really walked through these things. We've really worked through these things. These are real practices that I have in my life and that we have in our life that keeps us before the feet of Jesus and in real relationship and conversation with each other. This is the stuff of life. And so as I'm walking through this, it's not like, you know, we're perfect pastors and we're giving you something. This is real nitty gritty stuff. So talk with Jesus first. So I, and so for me, that's, okay, I go, you know, I find myself in the bathroom. I'm facing the toilet. There's a window. The toilet paper's right here. And I'm going like, okay, I think this. This is what I think. And I'm angry. And like, and so, so like Jesus, this is what I see. And this is what I'm frustrated about. I think this, this, and this, like he doesn't get it. He, you know, he doesn't see all that I'm doing. Uh, I, I feel underappreciated not all the time, but these are, these, are the, these are the things, right? But Jesus, will you show me what you see in their life? And will you show me how I am doing the same thing in my life? Because if I'm trying to take a speck out of someone else's eye, I have to remember that there's a log in my own eye. And so what will happen is after a talk with Jesus, you might have new perspective and new compassion, or the person that you're angry with, or the person that you're you're disagreeing with, because you know if you've ever said like they're so selfish or what, or you know they're so lazy or, or whatever. Um, <laughs> what I love about the Lord is I'll you know I'll I'll be in that place and He'll say, Yeah, Tiff, you may be really good in this area, but do you remember the conversation that happened a while ago, where where He tried to bring some things up and you just kind of completely shut Him down, you know? Like, were you being, and so it's like that reminder, like, yes, th- that may be true because we're all human, but there's some selfishness in, in your own heart, and there was some grace that was extended to you, and so I, I need you to do the same thing because you may be good in this area, but there's lack in this area, and so in the same way, there's got to be grace for the people we live with. They may be good in this area, but there's got to be grace for them in this area because not one of us is perfect. We, we all fall short of the, the glory of God, and so after that, there's, there's a tenderness because you might now also be in a place where, okay, I see that, but I need some wisdom now. And I need some insight into how to make those changes or to how, like, okay, how am I going to communicate effectively then? Because I'm realizing I've been passing a lot of judgment and I've been making a lot of accusations and I've been making a lot of assumptions, but in my own life, grace has been showed to me. So Jesus, I need you to help me correct the way I've been communicating. I need you to you help me change the way that I've been acting or some of my behaviors. So Matthew said, and Jesus keeps going. He's talking to the same crowd of people. And he says, keep on asking and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will be open to you for everyone who asks receives, everyone who seeks finds, and to everyone who knocks, the door will be open. And then he says, you parents, if your children ask for a loaf of bread, do you give them a stone instead? Or if they ask for a fish, do you give them a snake? Of course not. So if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father give give good gifts to those who ask of him. And that's where we see the tenderness because it may have sounded harsh in the beginning where he says, you know, passing judgment. But then he says, there's a good father in heaven. And if you will see, and if you will ask, he will give it to you. He will satisfy all of your needs and all of your desires. When you ask for a healthy relationship, when you ask for help in leaning in and communicating better, he is so good and faithful to answer that. And so the question becomes, what are you asking your father for? And are you asking? What are you asking your father for? And are you asking? So that second blank, if you're taking notes, is ask your father for what you need. Ask your father for what you need. So for me, this is, I'm, I'm a, kind of a very visual person, I guess. But I imagine, so first I'm in the bathroom and I'm talking with Jesus, okay? Now I'm asking Father God for what I need. And so what's happening is, this is how it is. The, Jesus is in the middle. I'm over here on Jesus' left side for some reason. Like, that's just the comfortable side. Probably because when Elliot and I walk, I'm on the left side and we hold pinkies. It's my first finger in his pinky. I don't like the, this is uncomfortable for me. Anyway, so it's the the, the finger and the, and the first finger in the pinky. So we're walking. I, Jesus is in the middle. I'm here. And then Elliot is on the other side 
of Jesus. This is how I visualize it. And, and I, so when I was thinking about it, I was like, well, why am I not holding hands with Elliot? Like, he's my husband. Why am I holding hands with, Je why is Elliot over there and Jesus in the middle? And for me, it was this picture. Oh, so maybe I'll face you. Jesus is here. Elliot's here. I'm here. And it's, we're, we're one, when we got married, we're one, we're one flesh, but we're one flesh in Christ. If Christ isn't in the middle of us, I don't know how to be one flesh. Why? Because I'm selfish, because I'm lazy, because I'm arrogant, because I'm insecure. I've got all these issues, right? We all come into life and, and, and marriage and relationship with issue. But when Jesus is in the middle of it and he's the one connecting us, all of a sudden there's a safer space for me to be able to process and do that. So I'm walking with Jesus and this is what's happening. I imagine we're walking with Jesus. We're holding hands. He's in the middle. We're on either side. And I can genuinely talk to Jesus about what is going going on in my heart and in my life. I can be honest with him about my doubts. I can be honest with him about my frustrations. I can be honest with Jesus about my fears. And what I love is in the picture, Jesus laughs, you know, and then he shows me where I have done the exact same things in my life. And that's, that's what it is. We're walking together and I'm just, you know, I'm sharing like, I'm so frustrated because like, I feel like this keeps happening and, I, and I'm not exactly sure how to change it. And like, and so, you know, he's a good friend. The scripture declares that he's a friend to us. And so he's, and he, he just kind of, he laughs and he doesn't, you know, he remembers things. He knows everything. And so he just kind of laughs and he says, yeah, Tiff, but like, do, again, do you, do you remember this? Do you, and I'm like, ah, yeah. And then all of a sudden there's a peace in my heart because I've talked with Jesus first and I've worked through the emotion of it all. Now I'm ready to go over and talk with a real person face to face. I'm ready to talk with Elliot face to face, but I had to get oh. healing first walking with Jesus and asking the father for what I need. So there's steps in asking the father. The first one is I confess which means I agree with Jesus in what I've done. So Jesus, you're right. I, I agree with you. I, I have done that exact same thing. I have done that. I have said that. I have been hurtful. I have been angry. I have not listened. I have, whatever it is, I confess that I have done that. I agree with you. And then it's repentance. Because once I see that, I'm like, well, I don't like that. You know, I don't want it done to me. So there's repentance. I don't want to do that anymore because I see now that it's hurtful. And so I need help. So what, G Father, what do I say or what do I do in order to change what I've been doing? I repent of it. And then I ask. And this is the, the asking part. This is what I want to get to. I have to verbalize. This is what I've been worried about. So I've been worried about this. And so I've been acting like this. Because a lot of times we'll worry about something, we'll have anxiety, we'll have fear, we'll have stress. We won't verbalize that part, we'll just react to our spouse instead of sharing what's actually going on here. So I'm talking with the Lord and I'm saying, I have been worried about, and so I have been acting like, but what I really want and what I really need is this. So will you show me what I need to do to do that? Will you show me what I need to say in order to have that? Or I've been, I've been stressed or I felt strapped because of, and so I've been acting like, and what I really want to see and what I really need is this. And this is something that you, I'm going to tell you, you might have to do this every day. You're going to have to, this isn't a one and done thing. These are things we do one time. You know what I mean? Like things come up all the time. This isn't a thing that we have to do often. Because Jesus is there. He's in the middle of our marriage. He's in the middle of our circumstance. He's with us all the time. But we've got to choose him. He's an option. And we have, he's more than an option. He's our life. He's our salvation. He's our Lord. Everything we have is in him, but we have to choose him. So we know in our minds, maybe that we're married. And if you're already a believer, we know in our minds that we're married. We know in our lives that we're a Christian, but we have to live out a walk with Jesus. There's an extra step in our lives that the world knows nothing about. And the extra step is a person. There's a person that we get to engage with in the middle of our marriage who helps us in our time of need, who is a great counselor and gives us wisdom when we need it, who is the friend that we can talk to when we're not sure who else to talk to. There's an extra step and he's a person. And so to live out that in our lives, it requires engagement with him, walking with him, being 
walking with him, remembering his presence in the middle of our marriage. And then after you have the conversation with your spouse, if you're not married, then you have to, those, these are conversations we have with the people we have tension in our lives with. If we have tension in our lives with people, it's probably because we've passed a judgment on them. And if we've passed a judgment on them, we need to go back and find out who did I agree with? Did I agree with Father God about who that person is? Or did I agree with the enemy and pass a lie about who that person is? So I've got to go back. I've got to talk with Jesus. I've got to ask the Father. And then after I've got clarity there, I go to the person I have tension with. And you, so you can write this down, talk with your spouse. You talk with Jesus first, and then you talk with your spouse. <laughs> and this is super fun. Elliot has taught me how to apologize, okay? When we got married, I mean, like, he's, he's so you guys know his story. He went through the Salvation Army. He's done all the steps. I feel like the steps, so anybody who's in recovery, you have got, most of you have great relational skills. You have learned some things that the rest of us have not. <laughs> when, when you go through and you make amends and just own in your stuff, if you work the steps, like you are incredible people who have great communication skills. And I lacked them hardcore when we got married. I still do. And it is, okay. When I say Elliot taught me how to apologize, can I tell you that the most frustrating thing on planet earth is being corrected when you're trying to say, I'm sorry. Okay. But it's okay. This is also needed when your apology, your apology, is the most sarcastic, begrudging, underhanded apology known to man. Okay, so I would say this is real life. I would say I'm sorry, and we would go rounds, rounds about the fact that that wasn't an apology. So now, whatever disagreement we were having, we're having now about this also. Okay. Don't tell me that I didn't, I got, I, I apologize to you. Years, it took me years to figure out that he was right and I was wrong and I had to do better, okay? The prideful, arrogant one might be me, okay? <sighs> okay, so I'm gonna give you some examples though. This is real life, I'm gonna give you some examples. There's my kind of apology that says, <sighs> I'm sorry I did that to you, but you just made me so angry when you said this and this. You know what I do? I say I'm sorry, and I bring it up again. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's not an apology. I didn't know that. I didn't, I thought that was legitimate. Like, I'm apologizing to you, but I need you to know that you hurt me and I was angry. And so we're going to hash it out until I get exactly what I want out of the deal. And he's over here going, That's not an, that's not an apology. Like, you didn't mean any of that. You didn't, you didn't repent for anything. I'm like, I'm I said I was sorry. Okay. Blah. That's justifying. Okay. I'm going to justify myself before you. I, I'm sorry I did that, but I was completely justified in my actions because of what you did to me. <laughs> and then there's the real, the real kind of apology, which is way better, harder to do, takes more time. It takes more time. For me, it may take me a day, a whole 24 hours to get to this point, but I've, he's way faster. Elliot is so fast. I'm like, da, 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 da. This is what it is. Hey. I always say hey, because I, anyway, hey. I should not have said that to you. It was mean, and it was hurtful. I was a little bit hurt, and I got angry in our conversation earlier, and it wasn't right for me to say what I did. Big difference. Big difference between the two of those. I'm still acknowledging the fact that I was angry, but I'm also acknowledging the fact that I was hurt. That's expressing an emotion. I'm letting you see that I was hurt by that, but I'm not making the hurt your fault. I'm not going to make you pay me back for it. I'm recognizing that I got hurt and I reacted. I'm taking ownership for my own actions and my own words. And it's true that I may have been hurt, but it, that doesn't give me permission to hurt you back. As a follower of Jesus, that does not give me permission to hurt you back. And that is different from the way that the world works. There's a big difference between these two because one of them opens the door. Like now there's an open door for conversation because we're not rehashing the past. We're entering into the future going, okay, I'm seeing some things. Normally what that will do, and I've learned, I've learned this because Elliot would do that with me. I, 
he would come back and he would apologize to me. And what would happen is, and he would apologize that way. Hey, I shouldn't have said that to you. It was mean and it was hurtful. I got hurt. Uh, in that in that conversation, and so I said some things that I shouldn't have said. And so instead of making me more angry, what it would do would be like, oh man, yeah, I was hurt too, and I was angry. And so so what it does is it opens up the 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 door for real conversation to happen and real healing to happen and a place to move forward. Whereas my kind of apology, it doesn't do that. That's like you know when when you like you get real angry at someone and so you go and you slam the door and then you lock it and then you you barricade furniture up in front of it so they can never get back inside. Like we're never having this conversation ever again. I'm sorry I did that to you. Like one of them barricades and the other one in, invites. Like one of them is the door is slammed shut. It's never gonna open again and you just build up hurt on top of hurt on top of hurt on top of hurt. And the other one is definitely more vulnerable, but it invites way more healing and a real connected and togetherness. But can I tell you, you can't get to that place unless you're with Jesus first. Jesus does that healing process first, and then I can have a real conversation. Why? Because I'm safe and secure, and I'm right with Almighty God. And when I do that, now I'm carrying the rightness of Almighty God into this relationship, and I need the, the, the rightness of Almighty God in my life. Okay, and then after you do all that, you talk with your spouse, you make things right. Now you share your hearts. Now you share your hearts, and then you pray together. That's the last one. You pray together. You have walked with Jesus. You have talked with Jesus. You have a new sense of peace and clarity. You've shared with your spouse. There is a new level of understanding and engagement. You're seeing them in a way that you haven't seen them before. You're seeing a piece or a part of them that was missing. You've shared pieces and parts with them. And then you pray together. You walk it out together. Praying together, that can be praying together, like together, together for some things, for healing, for restoration, for forgiveness. Thank you, Father, for your grace on our marriage. We ask that you would continue to give us wisdom and help us to love one another. But it's also praying apart. Lord, I, in, in your apart time, Lord, I thank you for my spouse, and I thank you for what you're doing inside of them. I thank you for the things that he's asking you for, and I ask, Lord, that you would help me to serve him well uh, in seeing those things. Would you give me wisdom and 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 help me to love and support him as he walks into the things that you're speaking to him. And same husbands for wives, you said the same thing. Now, <clears throat> Um, this is where I'm going to jump to first Peter real quick. I know you, if you were here a couple weeks ago and you heard Elliot say the marriage challenge, he said, this is one of the things he said when he was talking about that sermon, he said, this is not for them. It's for you. <laughs> this is not for them. It's for you. So we're not elbowing the person next to us going, man, I wish they would do that. But still, here's the thing. Here's You still may be waiting for them to do it. You want them to go first. Maybe in your own life, you think I have gone first many times. I've gone first in the past and I don't want to go first again. I don't want to be the one who keeps leading the way. I don't want to be the one. I want them to do it. I want them to get it. I want them to make a change. I'm talking to wives. Specifically, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1. I want us to win. I want us to win people over. Peter, Peter, a married man, is talking to the church. He says, in the same way, you wives must accept the authority of your husbands. <clears throat> then even if some refuse to obey the good news, your godly lives will speak to them without any words. And so that begs the question for me, what way? What, in what way? In what way am I supposed to accept the authority of my husband? For, I'm going to back up to 1 Peter chapter 2. Uh, Peter first talks to slaves and he says, for God called you to do good, even if it means suffering, just as Christ suffered for you. He is your example and you must follow in his steps. He never sinned nor ever deceived anyone. He did not retaliate when he was insulted, nor threaten revenge when he suffered. He left his case in the hands of God who always judges fairly. He personally carried our sins in his body on the cross so that we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. By his wounds, you are healed once. You were like sheep who had wandered away, but now you have turned to your shepherd, the guardian of your souls. So then he says, in the same way, he's talking about Jesus, the example that Jesus set. He says, in the same way, you wives must accept the authority of your husbands. 
then even if some refuse to obey the good news, that's just living out the stuff. Even if some refuse to obey the good news, your godly lives will speak to them without any words. They will be won over by observing your pure and reverent lives. So that's talking about our lifestyle. That's talking about our attitude. That's talking about our position and understanding who we are in Christ and how we're called to live, regardless of what the world is doing around us. I know if I live this lifestyle, there's going to be an authority and a blessing that's going to come upon my life. And this is, so I want to just say to us, the last thing is do the stuff. Do the stuff. When I say the stuff, I mean all the things we just talked about. Living and walking with Jesus. Living in an attitude of repentance and confession and asking. Remembering that there is a God who is always with us. A comforter, a friend who walks with us. And this is huge. Our God, he honors his word and he honors those who honor his word. And this stuff, the stuff it's eternal and it's far reaching. This, this stuff is the stuff that allows God to open doors that no one can shut in your life. When you want open doors in your life, it's simply doing the stuff of Jesus. It's living out our lifestyle in this manner. It's going first because he went first. He went first. And so it doesn't matter what anybody else is doing. My life was bought with a price and I'm a representative and ambassador of Jesus, even in my marriage, even in my family. And so I'm going to go first. I'm going to lead the way. I'm going to honor. I'm going to repent. I'm going to confess. I'm going to pray. And this stuff, this is spiritual warfare. When we talk about spiritual warfare, sometimes it's shouting and praying really loudly, but spiritual warfare is putting on the armor of God and walking out daily the things that Jesus has commanded us to do, the things that Jesus has called us to live in, to live like he did, to lay down our lives, to not retaliate, to pray and to cover. That's spiritual warfare. And in our marriages, wives, Wives, if we could do this, if we could pray, if we could confess, if we could walk with Jesus, if we could honor, if we could lead the way in humility and with understanding and allowing our spouses to see the inner workings of our heart, not to hide them and to be ashamed of them because we're maybe we're women and we cry. And so we put up walls and we put up defenses. Instead, if we would just allow, there's a tenderness there. And when, when, when our husbands are invited into that tenderness, it causes them to rise up and to defend and to protect because this is what God created them to do. And so we don't need to be, there's a courage, but we don't need to be courageous. We don't need to have it all together. There's a tenderness and there's a strength. And that's the, the perfect image of who our God is and is found in marriage. And that's spiritual warfare. And so I would say, even if you're having a hard time in your marriage, would you do it for your kids? If you want to talk about breaking generational curses off your life, when you look in your past that there's been tension or divorce, would you do it for the future? Because God honors those who honor his word. And so wives, would you lead the way? Going, I'm going to honor my husband. I'm going to serve him. I'm going to love him. I'm going to go first. And I'm doing it because I'm breaking a generational curse. And I'm speaking blessing into their future. I'm going to lead the way. And I'm going to do it. This is the stuff when we do it that pushes back the enemy of our souls, who tries to steal our life and our peace from right underneath us. If we would do this stuff, we would stand with peace, we would stand with courage, we would stand with grace. This is spiritual warfare, and it is the stuff that we can do. This is all the stuff that we can do. I'm just going to pray for us. If you guys would close your eyes and bow your heads, I'm going to lead us in prayer. Father, I thank you so much for your kindness, for your generosity, and for your strength. I thank you that you are our good father and you desire to give us good gifts. Lord, you want us to come to you and ask you for things because you love to give good things to your children. And Father, I thank you for marriages, husbands and wives, that the coming together of, of husbands and wives is a picture Lord, of you and your church and how much you love us. It's a representation of the, of the complete Godhead because you are strength and you are, you are power, you are might, but you are also tender, you are also caring, you are kind, you are loving. And when we come together, there's the, the beautiful expression of who you are. And so I speak blessing right now over the marriages and the relationships in this room.
Lord, I thank you for the words that you speak to us. I thank you that you lead us. God, and I ask that as we walk out of this place today, Lord, there would be an encouragement, Lord, to do the things, to do the stuff, and to let you be completely in the center of our relationships, completely in the center of our lives, where you are our peace, you are our strength, you are our source. You allow us to be vulnerable. You allow us to express ourselves so that we can be in real, right relationship with the people around us. We would be in a place of security and wholeness because we are first secure and right in you. And I just want to give us an opportunity. If, if you feel like you don't have that relationship with Jesus, you've been trying to do your marriage on your own. You, you know you're a Christian maybe, or maybe you, you haven't made that decision, but you feel like Jesus hasn't been in the center. And there's there's been suffering there's been hardship, there's been difficulty, there's been blocked roads. And you would say, I want to invite Jesus back into the center of my relationship. I want to invite him back into the center of my marriage. I want to bow down before him and I want to lay myself aside and I walk in. I want to walk in that. Would you just lift your hand in the air? I want Jesus back in the middle of my marriage. I want to honor him. Amen. I see your hand. I love that. There's anybody else who would say, I, I want Jesus in that space. I want more for my marriage. I want more for my family. Amen. I see your hands. God is so good. Uh, I just want to invite us to, we're all play, pray this together, but you can just repeat after me. Father God, I thank you for your son, Jesus. I thank you for your love. And I invite you to be in the middle of my life. I invite you to be Lord of my life. To lead me. To guide me. I receive your spirit. Who is my comforter. Who is my counsel. Would you help me to honor you? Would you cover my life with your blessing? I thank you for your provision. In Jesus' name, amen.